Many thanks to the two of you um, for anecdotes and data. Um, I think both were a mixture of both, but I'm not going to argue uh, on that one. Um, before, uh, I think I'd just like to um, invite John uh, to uh, reply to some of the points uh, that Lars Feld has been uh, making, if you would like to. Um, maybe we can try, first of all, to ask um, other points where, where you're in agreement, where you'd say, well, yes, um, okay, according to uh, what Lars Feld has been saying, I don't really see there's a lot of difference, and where are the main points where you really want to, to argue with him? Um, well, uh, I think the, the interesting thing is that um, we've all spent a lot of time looking at data. Um, and as the years go by, I continue to look at the data uh, and uh, at multiple sources of data, which come to very contradictory conclusions uh, for the very simple reason that the data depends on what you feed into it. And that's why I kept making the point that um, there are many forms of inflation, for example, that are not counted because the basket, again, it depends on where you are, it depends on the level you're at. The baskets, in many cases, haven't changed enough. They haven't taken things into account. That's why I mentioned the question of armaments as a form of inflation which was not taken into account in the counting, which then becomes an explanation for what isn't working or what is confusing two economists, frankly. So I'm always thrilled to see graphs. I love graphs. Um, but uh, I'm never entirely convinced. And uh, because I've seen other graphs, uh, which don't say the same thing. Um, and I haven't come with a, 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 a collection of graphs to say, here's my graph against your graph, as if we were playing cards. Um, but when you tell me that the World Bank has gone out and done the data, um, uh, again, you know, I don't fall back on anecdotes easily. I use anecdotes because, you know, Alice Munro, who just won the Nobel Prize, a uh, great writer, and um, said uh, the, the f facts, uh, well, they tell you the facts of life, and novels tell you the truth about life. And so in some ways, when you're looking at politics and, e and political economics, you have to look at the data. You also have to look at the effects. So your story about India is, of course, interesting and fascinating. And I'm very glad that people are investing in India. I've just come from three weeks there. But on the other hand, the Naxalites, which would not have a life if it were not for what's happening to the economy in India, the Naxalites control how many states in India? Is it 10? I'm trying to remember now. Is it 8 or 10 or 12? I can't remember. So here you have this country which, according to international statistics, has all these interesting things happening, and yet the direct result of it is the rise of the Naxalite Maoist armies controlling a large percentage of the country, a direct result of the economic changes, collapse in the agricultural sector, a new aristocracy, nouveau riche aristocracy, built almost entirely on the French 18th century noblesse de la robe model, living in gated communities to which, you know, Western uh, experts in following in Friedman's steps get out of airplanes, uh, get in cars and go into the gated communities, industrial communities and say, my God, look at the wonders of India, whereas in fact something else is happening, otherwise Modi would not be on the verge of being elected. So this is why it, it, it's not exactly anecdotes. Anecdotes are used to try and get beyond the contradictory graphs to figure out what's really happening. The other thing is that when one is, what the World Bank has been very bad at figuring out how to count and how to deal with the things that weren't counted. So that, for example, you will often have cases where people were living in certain kinds of communities which simply were not countable according to Western standards, World Bank standards. And suddenly they move from those, those situations where they're getting by, but they don't exist internationally, and they're going into slums where the conditions are actually far worse, but statistically they're making a dollar a day. And this kind of misuse of the calculations, and I see a number of people who know these situations, I'm struck 
so much. I mean, I, mean, I don't want to go on and on with, with anecdotes. I sat not long ago in South Africa in what's considered the leading business school. I now can't remember the name. We spent an entire morning where you would have had the impression you were, li you were in, in Germany. And then at the end of the morning, I said, you know, you haven't actually mentioned the townships. You haven't actually mentioned what's happening to most of the population in South Africa. And they said, oh, yeah, we never talk about that. Why don't we talk about it this afternoon? So that has to do with the nature of the data and the concept of who's included in the conversation and who's excluded from the conversation. So it's not yeah. really an answer. Mm -hmm. It's a contextualization. Okay, Be before I ask Lars Feld uh, to well, can uh, I just add to one? Can I just say one thing? Adam okay. Smith is always brought up. Okay. Adam Smith wrote one important book. Two. One important <laughs> book. And then <laughs> one, and then he wrote the footnote to the important book. So the important book is The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which is based on empathy, as you know, I'm sure you know. You seem to be the kind I of read, guy who's I read, read it. both, yes. Yes. <laughs> You're one of the rare who've read. <laughs> no, I'm not one of the rare. In no, The Economist. And, and no. then he wrote a footnote, which was, of course, his book on economics. And the central message of Andrew Smith is empathy, and the marketplace is essential, provided it is regulated. I disagree, totally. Well, I, I, there are a large number of us you who know, agree with me. Adam, so. Adam, Adam, okay, Smith, wait, wait. Adam Smith wrote two very important books, and he thought both are very important because uh, what you can say in support of my hypothesis is that everything else was burned by him. He burned everything uh, of his estate and left only these two books over. And he thought that both of them are at the same level. Well, that's so what, what his tombstone says. So you says. can interpret, of course, this uh, the wealth of nations to be a footnote to this theory of moral sentiments. And I know of some economists who see it uh, um, vice versa. Uh, but I think they are at the same level. The may tomb may just so and then we'll, we'll end on Adam Smith. The tombstone is very clear. The tombstone says Adam Smith, author of The Theory of Moral Sentiments and The Wealth of Nations. <laughs> <laughs> Go and look at it. So yeah, well, as I say, you have both <laughs> on those uh, tombstones, yeah, and you are interpreting the uh, order uh, of it on the tombstone as being if important. If I remember rightly, it's the but size also. Wrong. But this is wrong. Before I ask Lasfeld um, to comment on some of the points you've been making. Maybe we could just for a moment um, stay with one point which I personally think is very important, the question of um, how do we have quantitative and qualitative oh. indice? Sorry. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> the water is gone. But here's water. <laughs> Look. I'll open it for you in a second. Um, the, question, the question, I think, of um, what kind of data are we using is one which appears to me to be uh, important, um, certainly even with uh, quantitative data. Uh, we know now, and I think that is not a point which is argued about, that the importance of NGOs and civil society um, locally uh, has become extremely important. I would like to ask um, how indeed is the connection between local data, which can not only be quantitative but also qualitative, uh, to the development of international indices? Is this a point that we could pick up on and say we have to look at this more? Um, I know that uh, the United Nations is beginning uh, to ask this kind of question, and um, those who uh, visit the Karlsruhe dialogues uh, regularly know that I also also say, um, do we have enough interdisciplinary um, mm. thought going into the way uh, we construct indices uh, at a scientific level? Um, we know the economists have been very much um, criticized uh, for their models, especially um, before or not, not um, seeing that the finance crisis was going to come. I don't want to go into that conversation. We've had that before. Uh, but I would like to ask about the way we gather data. We'll stay with the data. Um, how do we connect quantitative and qualitative so we have uh, the descriptions of local situations um, because I think uh, that is a question we will be looking at this afternoon, uh, the, the local situations uh, which are not seen indeed in the data 
which you've been showing us. And um, I think we have to talk about how do we have both and how do we need both and how is the connection between uh, the two. May I ask Lars Feld maybe first uh, to comment on that and then, of course, to answer what you have been uh, saying to him, John. Okay. Um, when you look at the development of uh, international data, you can say first um, it has been a uh, considerable improvement to have the World Bank look at those data and not only have the United Nations data. Because when the United Nations started, they got the official data from each country. And so the elite in the country fixed the data very often in order uh, to influence how it was seen from the outside world. Um, with the World Bank interfering, um, also interfering uh, locally, making their own um, um, data collection in different countries, um, pressure was exerted on uh, those countries fixing their data. You have situations like these always um, today. Think about Argentina, for example. Argentina is currently fixing its inflation data, which is uh, three times as high as the official figures. Uh, and um, in, in such situations, you are happy with an international organization uh, showing their, uh, sending their own personnel into, that, into those countries and trying to solicit data. Of course, uh, the World Bank is not immune to any criticism. You always have uh, difficulties uh, in uh, collecting the right data. None of these data is uh, fully without uh, uh, criticism. What the uh, World Bank is doing, um, it is uh, trying to cooperate with uh, several uh, organizations that are independent, that are working on the ground. Um, but it must be, on the other side, careful not to introduce the, selective, uh, uh, the, selective, the selectivity problems emerging from that situation. So what uh, John was just saying regarding uh, the situation in South Africa, when you look at uh, the uh, western parts, so to speak, where you feel like in Europe, and on the other side you go to the townships or to slums, uh, where things are quite different, um, you must also be careful not to look only at the slums and uh, try to get a situation there. Um, I wouldn't say that the World Bank is uh, really doing a fabulous job in that regard. It could improve always. But uh, on the other side, I would not say that these data are totally unreliable. That's the other side of it. And therefore, I use them. Otherwise, I would not use them. We have a policy in the uh, Council of Economic Experts only using the best data available. And that's what we uh, normally do. Um, the interdisciplinary work, you extended that to um, the uh, theoretical modeling and also uh, econometric modeling of uh, economies or of certain um, microeconomic, um, uh, microeconomic uh, parts of the world. Um, but this is not a data question. Uh, and concentrating on models theoretically is simply abstracting from the real world in order to make an argument. And whether you do that verbally or you do it mathematically is simply using different, different uh, types of languages, nothing else. So I would not uh, object very much against that, and I would not think that this is an argument against the data collection. Regarding interdisciplinary work, what you see currently in, um, in uh, development economics is a uh, trend towards uh, natural experiments in um, uh, less developed countries um, that have uh, or produce quite interesting results and also uh, produce quite interesting results regarding the outcome of economic policies that are conducted there. And um, in particular in this new literature you find uh, strong interdisciplinary uh, cooperation between uh, different sciences. Well, John. you know, I, I don't disagree with basically what you've said. Um, I think that the World Bank is more of a battleground than you're suggesting, though. Um, uh, I mean, this is now slightly old history, but Stiglitz resigned in deep frustration. And Wolfson... Uh, you, know, you know Stiglitz personally? Yeah. And Wolfson fought like a dog to change the culture of the World Bank so that it would be fairer, more inclusive, and I think in the end felt that he'd failed. Now, you can criticize Wolf Wolfson is right, isn't it? I am a little jet-lagged here, but uh, yeah. Um, I, he felt that he'd largely failed, that in fact the old structures had predominated and he had not been able to get it to open up to new ways of inclusive counting and new ways of doing data. Um, so. <laughs> 
And since then, as we know, there has been a lot of pressure put on screwing down. I mean, some things have improved, as you said, but I think also some things have gotten worse in the sense of politi political politicization and making sure that it didn't cause damage to what Washington wanted to come out of it and so on. So mm -hmm. I think there's been movements in a good way and movements in a very negative way at the same time. So you're right, we need other sources. I think the other thing, frankly, is, and this is really a university question. So you're looking at a, a guy with you know, a PhD and a lot of honor degrees, but who doesn't teach. Um, uh, I think that there is a real problem in our universities that the over-specialization, which we're in favor of because we want the data, we want the heart surgeon, but has nevertheless led us down a road where it's very hard to do serious interdisciplinary work. And we need a massive Sorry. opening up and re-examination of the economics departments. I think the direction in which the most economics departments have gone in the last 40 years has not been helpful. It's very self-congratulatory. Some are worse than others. Maybe it's better in Germany. But it certainly isn't good in, in, in most of Western Europe and North America. It's uh, increasingly tied into views coming out of the business schools. And it's, it's structuring the data to give comfort to the points of view of the economists. And there's been almost a, a sort of intellectual cleansing of many of the e economics departments over the last 40 years so that you're not getting a lot of contradictory debate inside the economics departments, which you used to get. And this is one of the reasons we're having trouble get, getting the debates we need. And this is why so much has fallen off to the um, NGOs. I mean, mm -hmm. the NGOs appear in really in large numbers in the 80s, start appearing and multiplying and multiplying, not because of an opening up, but because of a closing up. They come because they can't, because citizens feel they can't get at the debate because the governments, the technocracy, the managers in the universities are closing up to them and the corporations, and therefore you get this undemocratic sort of Manichaean shadow of the enemy, which is the NGOs. This is not a long-term solution, but it's the only solution that seemed to be available at the time. And we're now starting to see the problem of having the NGOs trying desperately to do this while the others are saying, well, we'll cooperate a little bit if you come to the table. Hey, we could fund you a bit. Oh, well, we're not going to fund you if, if you do that. I mean, I see this on a daily basis. The, 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 the ways in which the EU, uh, the institutions are making it more and more difficult for the NGOs to do their work because the control of the funding lies with the people they are in effect working against. So it's the long-term solution is the reinjection of the citizens into the basis of the democratic process. And frankly, in Europe, you have a major problem. I think worse than in some other parts of the world of citizens saying, and Germany's maybe better, France is a disaster, Spain, people are simply going around it. Britain, they always think they're involved, but in fact, it's very <laughs> marginal in a way. The size of membership in the political parties has plummeted. I don't know about in Germany, but in every country I know it's plummeted. The, so the loss of confidence in the role of the citizens in the democratic process, this is key to the change in the debate. Can I catch on to that? Because I think this is something that just buy, yeah. uh, came up yesterday uh, in our uh, opening uh, session. Uh, and certainly today, I'm sure we will uh, go into this more. Um, the connection then also to leadership. Um, leadership um, within uh, the political system, political parties, uh, the problem, as you say, that in many, many countries uh, we have less um, people wanting to be involved in uh, professional politics at the same time, one of our parado our paradox uh, that politicians are seen as being they 're very unpopular, so why should one go into politics? Um, just a sort of footnote to what we are talking about, and on the other hand, um, the question of uh, the qualification of leadership. Where do we find or how do we qualify our leaders? I think we are now talking about the um, civilitatorische, civil um, now I'm speaking half German, half English, um, turn, the participatory turn. Yeah. Um, 
which maybe at times is also seen rather naively. I mean, if we just look at the um, question of um, participatory uh, democracy, um, we've just had the example, uh, which you probably have followed, John, in Switzerland, um, that we have, of course, uh, a democratic decision uh, which um, would more um, support your um, observation that we are going back to uh, more nationalism, uh, that we have problems of um, racism, uh, which are not becoming better through globalization, uh, but for many different reasons, which we can't uh, fully uh, now um, uh, talk about, um, are on, um, on the hold. We, we have the European elections coming up, um, <laughs> where we shall probably see a lot of these effects. So uh, back to my question, what about leadership, um, both within the context of politics, uh, but also of people wanting from civil society to take mm. on uh, responsibility, make decisions, become involved? Um, it is not uh, because of a participatory turn uh, necessarily the case that people want to become involved and make decisions. Do we have a paradox also in that area? Well, I would say, first of all, uh, the increase in NGOs and uh, what you are calling the participatory turn in politics has, different, uh, has been induced by different forces. Um, it's been um, a, a closing by uh, the uh, typical party democracy we had before. Uh, we had changes in uh, uh, the classes of society that uh, everything has become uh, more differentiated. Uh, the pure, um, the, the pure uh, controversy between labor and capital that we used to know until the 70s, so to speak, that was not the center of uh, political debates until then, uh, is not uh, the same anymore since we went to a uh, informa since we went to information societies in the 80s. Uh, and on the other side, the, the opportunities and the funding of NGOs has increased as well. Despite the fact that, uh, of course, the large uh, states can still control larger funds and can do more than a single uh, NGO can do, but on the other hand, you see also very important um, financial um, support uh, by individuals for NGOs. Uh, think about what you were saying about the um, education problem in economics. Um, George Soros is financing what is called INETS, the Institute of New Economic Thinking. Yeah, I'm speaking of it. And uh, I wouldn't say, uh, well, when you, th when you think about George Soros and talk about him in Germany, he's much more seen than some, uh, as somebody trying to influence um, uh, the teaching and economics uh, in his direction in order to make more money. Uh, so you, you're, never, you're never sure uh, what type of funding is right and which is not. So I, I would say, I have also spoken at INET meetings, but still, I would be very uh, cautious uh, and would be happy when, uh, if there were sufficient competition between the different institutions. Competition is key in all those, uh, in, in all those relations. Um, when you are talking about participatory uh, democracy, something we observe is that at least in Germany, uh, I, I would trust the figures a bit more than in other countries, mm -hmm. uh, but in Germany we observe that uh, the people, the citizens in this country are less eager to engage in uh, the traditional parties. They don't do that uh, to the same extent as before. Um, they uh, even stick uh, to a lesser extent to the party uh, that belongs or belonged previously to, to his or her social milieu so to speak. But on the other side, you observe that, ci that citizens are very happy and very eager to engage otherwise, to have more influence in politics. If it is not, we are po political parties. And this is what you are calling the participatory turn. And therefore, instruments of direct democracy have become uh, popular in Germany too. We have a, a real wave of direct democracy at the state and local level since uh, the reuni reunification took place. Uh, in 15 years ago, in 1999, I wrote a book on direct democracy, particularly in Switzerland. Um, it was after the Swiss decided not to join the European Economic Area in 1992. And many of my uh, uh, economist colleagues were saying we must uh, reform the Swiss constitution uh, to adopt uh, a British Westminster system. 
uh, because uh, otherwise we are not able to cope with uh, the uh, challenges from co globalization. We are not fast enough. This is preventing us from opening up towards uh, the world, towards internationalization. Or argument at that point was, perhaps the, de the decision was wrong, but you don't uh, have to judge uh, institutions by single decisions, but uh, you have to judge them by the average impact on policies, on outcomes, on economic policies on the one side, but on other policies as well. And since then, uh, a huge amount of uh, studies have been conducted showing that um, these instruments of direct democracy in Switzerland uh, have a rather beneficial than disastrous mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't say that the uh, decision from last Sunday is uh, the end of the story. Uh, and the end of uh, the arguments uh, about direct democracy. Uh, it is only one single decision. I, I don't like it as well, but that's the way it is. <laughs> I mean, I think there's, uh, I mean, I agree again with your interpretation of it. I mean, I think there's a, uh, I mean, Switzerland is, you know, in some ways a case of, a, a, a case of I'm sorry, I'm in French, apart uh, on the side. Um, and, and the sort of the history of referenda is not a terribly happy history in general because it's got a longer attachment to the Napoleonic view of how to run countries than it does to the democratic view. It's, you know, most, most referenda, if they're overused, have to do with the beloved leader having to ha trying to get a yes or no, reducing the citizens to two very short words, as opposed to a long discussion in which, instead of a fast solution, you'd have this dissolved Wittgenstein approach of, uh, this is very complicated, let's work our way through it, which is not necessarily Westminster. It's the complexity of real society. So generally speaking, when you get above a certain size of the population, direct democracy starts to turn, if you're not careful, into, Populist. into populism, fascism, uh, Napoleonic. It just depends. I mean, you have to be very careful. I think there are moments when referendum are absolutely right. But it depends on the design of the particular institution. What you are talking about is what we call plebiscites. It's yeah. not a referendum. Well, it depends. It depends. What I'm saying is that you have to be very careful about, mm -hmm. the, way it's, about the way it's handled. I mean, I think that, that, that uh, the difficulty is that the rise of the NGO seems to have come almost directly out of the message of the 1970s and the beginnings of globalization, mm -hmm. which is that the underlying message of the launching of globalization was, and I'm slightly simplifying, but only slightly, if you go back and read the speeches, read the debates, was, listen, economic forces are gonna take over, the marketplace is gonna take over, borders don't matter. You know, I'm simplifying on purpose. So if you're a citizen in Germany or in a weaker country, you suddenly say, well, well what's my role? The marketplace is dominant, what's my role? I've got a secondary or a tertiary role. I thought I could set policy. So, in a way, that shutting down, and you had more and more politicians saying, in a, in a kind of getting out of their responsibilities, saying, oh, no, 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 we can't deal with that. That's the, the marketplace, or the international, or globalism, or trade deals have dealt with that. So I can't, I can't deal with it. So that really, I think, discouraged people from being involved in political parties, in voting, in politics, slowly. And, and then, out of that, you got this sort of parallel not democratic rise of public good mm -hmm. movement, which is the NGO. So, but the difficulty is, when you stand back and look at it decades later, is that d several generations of young people, some of whom are now 60, you know, gave up power in favor of influence. I mean, if you get elected, you can pass a law. You can pass a law that has to do with energy, that has to do with global warming. If you're influencing, you can't pass a law. You're trying to influence the guys you oppose, in effect. So I think there's a, there's, there's, you know, saying that because of information technology, people have moved away from political parties. I don't agree. I think people moved away from political parties because of the message sent out very strongly by our leadership mm. in all forms in the 1970s and 80s. And it was a disastrous message, which I think many of them now regret because they see the effect that it had. And my last comment is, I, 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 you know, I've written a lot about the rise of the managerial class. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not saying we don't need managers, but the, the incredible rise of the managerial class and the inflationary nature, the non-productive nature, the, uh, all, all of the effects of it. And, and, and this 
is profoundly not democratic. This is profoundly top or middle down. This is profoundly discouraging to citizens. And we're living the effects of that in the West to a great extent. And, but we're also seeing it, frankly, in the private sector, in the large corporations. That's why we saw, one of the reasons we saw this big move towards uh, mergers and acquisitions was mm -hmm. because of this. They didn't know how to take risks and they didn't know what risks really looked like in the old sense. So they basically did this false thing, which was let's put stuff together and pretend we've done something. You know. Okay. I'd like just to have a last question before we break and have the conversation at coffee. Um, being especially here in the uh, technology region of Karlsruhe. Can I just say, I, I do yeah. agree with you that, of course, what Soros <laughs> funds along with Basile is what they fund. But remember that we've just come through 40 years of there being very few funded alternate voices. And so it's actually quite interesting that there are a couple of well-funded alternate voices, even though one doesn't necessarily agree with them. At least there are some places that are coming up that can put up some voices that are not the same as a World Bank voice or the classic University Department of Economics voice or the classic managerial voice. I mean, and, and there is a need for that. Are there enough of them? No. Are those guys the right guys? No. You don't know. They are who they are, you know. I mean, we, we have to be conscious of who they are. Why they're doing it may not be as clear as they think. Um, but it's at least a place where something can be said. Okay. My last question very quickly, because we're running out of time. Um, <coughs> what about the question of um, new standards do we need and the role of small and medium-sized enterprise? What do you uh, mean New standards. We were ask, talking about new standards for social standards, um, ethics standards, uh, cultural standards within um, the uh, trade uh, trade uh, system. Um, what is the chance that entrepreneurship, in uh, the meaning of small and uh, middle-sized um, firms or companies with new ideas, um, that this is a young, new generation. I mean, this small and middle-sized middle um, firms here in our area play a very important role. But we also have young people coming into uh, opening up their new firms. Is this a chance that, on the sort of the other side of globalization, that we are indeed um, a sort of, of grassroots with uh, good ideas, imagination, which you were also saying, an idea also that Ulrich Beck is always uh, saying we need to um, use more of the creativity, the imagination we have. Um, how can we get that more into the economic um, uh, means of setting up um, new uh, young <coughs> firms with young ideas, but incorporating standards which are rather different to the, the multi um, um, situation that we have in the large corporations with, 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 with top-down management. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll ask Lars Feld, first of all, um, how would you see the development yes. of small and medium-sized well, in, in my presentation at the end, I said I don't see the need for uh, international uh, standards, uh, be it labor market standards or environmental standards or whatever, being enforced by an international organization. Um, what we usually but will see it just come from on its own? I mean, is this a, a culture? It could come of from its own, from the bottom. Standards. Yes, yeah. it can emerge from that, and that this is something what we usually observe that the higher the income of a country becomes, uh, the, uh, the the stronger the pressure towards higher standards because uh, first hand you can uh, afford uh, to have higher standards. This is not costly, so somebody must cover these costs, and the higher the income is, the easier it is to cover the costs of higher standards. And on the other side, um, when uh, people have higher income, um, their uh, wishes uh, for uh, higher standards uh, are becoming more uh, dominant because uh, their main uh, consumption um, uh, necessities have been covered before. So uh, it will come on its own, so to speak. But this doesn't preclude uh, um, the uh, individual pressure that consumers in our countries can put on particular firms. When you think about um, uh, the uh, big oil firms that had particular problems in the past, consumer movements put restrictions on them. And this is something you could do. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when you think about uh, the production of uh, 
meet in Germany, there are particularly low standards, and currently I observe a movement uh, uh, around Germany going away from uh, cheap meat. Uh, this is something you could do, but you pay a price for it. You must be aware of, aware of that. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this is very important. Um, this is a double mor moral, which I was speaking about yesterday, that we also, as, as uh, consumers, um, yes, we yeah. agree with all these things, but we're not saying we don't want to pay the price. Yeah, this is important for us. Uh, we are free to choose, so to speak. So we can choose to pay a higher price for a better product. Why not? Um, some people don't want to, but uh, um, other people do. So this is a, a movement you can create. And uh, not, uh, not infrequently, those movements come up um, uh, via social media. Uh, <laughs> and are used like that. Uh, but uh, I would also be careful not to introduce not to introduce um, social standards or environmental standards in the legal sense in the European Union, for example, uh, because this is always a possibility to protect your own, I should say, industrialized agricultural markets. The breakdown of agricultural markets in, in many less developed countries is just because of protectionism. Um, I don't want to well, put well, anybody in this corner, as you were saying, but of course it is, this no, is a protectionist Europe, tendency. To US and Europe taking the lead on doing that. Yeah, well, but when Probably. you... When you look at Sorry, U.S. and Europe probably taking this the lead is the in US doing and that. This is the U.S. and Europe, but what you can see as well is that um, within Europe, depending which is dominating in which country, you have differences. In the case of agriculture, France is putting yeah. uh, a very uh, strong know, pressure in Europe on protectionism. Yeah. So, um, uh, look, um, we went slightly off your question, but... You know, Lars, when Lars said that he had his da data doesn't show a decline in labor market standards, this is where I begin to say, okay, there's a real problem with the data. It just isn't true. I mean, it is not true that there has not been a decline in labor market standards. As I said at the beginning, Germany may have stood up better than other countries to the pressures, but, it, you know, the, there, there is rafts of other data which show that there is very serious decline in labor market standards. Now, some of it, you know, I, I'm not making an argument in favor of uh, the old British coal union or anything. I'm, I'm talking about labor market standards, and that's why I talk about the four-job family and then, you know, indebted students in many parts of the world, uh, increase in education costs, rise in private schools. The rise in the percentage of private people going to private schools, which is a, you know directly has a direct effect on on the democratic role of the public school. Again, maybe Germany isn't suffering in the way many countries are, but it's happening in many many parts of the world, including in places like China and India. You know, so um, th this then brings me to the second point, which is. We have gone, we the citizens, let me put this in a very almost populist terms. We the citizens have been very generous for 40 years. We've sat back and said, okay, you guys, the economists, the managers, the believers in the ideology of globalization, you tell us that if we go with trade, you're going to fix stuff. So we allowed you to regulate an international mechanism for trade in great detail. Very complicated, those trade deals. I mean, everything in this room Everything in this room, everything we're wearing is in those trade deals in enormous detail, right? We agree about this. At the moment we say, well, since we've done away with the borders on trade, I guess we better do something about international taxation levels or international environment levels or international education levels or international legal levels. So, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, we mustn't slow things down. We mustn't get in the way of the marketplace. I'm terribly sorry. The basis of democracy was we built our economies thanks to the fact that we built our democracies on the basis of public education, citizens, involvement of citizens that created a kind of stability which allowed us to put in place the German, uh, for example, the German uh, economy in a successful balanced way after the Second World War as opposed to the kind of uh, corporatist way of the of Bismarckian model. So we know that there is a direct relationship between economic regulations to open up and yet regulate on the one hand and things like taxes, uh, schooling, uh, uh, justice and so on. It is not right to say that if we're going to regulate one at the international level we shouldn't regulate the others. And the other thing I find fascinating is the moment you say well let's do international taxes, immediately the globalists say oh that would be too complicated. There is nothing more complicated than a trade deal. 
the That's sum of That's complexity is, That's is trade true. deals. No, no. And whereas, whereas taxation is dead easy have and you can ever be done looked in into very base, short. Have you ever looked in corporate tax bases how complicated they are? That's not true. I'm sorry. Simply I'm not sorry. <laughs> and you know, I'll tell you something else that's really interesting. And then you can call this anecdotal. I've asked several yeah, well, that's members problem. of Supreme Courts around the world about how do they deal with what's happened in the last 40 years. Heads of Supreme Courts, several countries. And so this is not anecdotal because heads of Supreme Courts are not anecdotal. Um, <laughs> they are like God, as I know, yes. They are like gods today. In Be God we trust, they are the deliver data. And they say, you know, we can no longer make judgments in which we can tell the difference between the social contract and the commercial contract. So this is a great victory for mm -hmm. your school of economics. It is a great defeat for the concept of the public good and democracy. And, sorry, last comment, which is actually the reply to your question, <laughs> which is, but, you know, <laughs> which, which is that I, I think that, you know, we didn't pick up on what I was saying about the surplus in, in goods, which I think is a very important point, along we with the managerial. We'll pick it up later in the day. Yeah, but, but I actually think that, you know, one of the answers to that question is value added. This is not about some people are willing to pay more for goods. This is about saying that the, sp the spiral downwards is not the answer if you have a surplus in goods. Actually, it isn't a, uh, a, the way you actually bring the, 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 the standard of living up is through having goods which are sold at prices which allow you to pay people at a lower middle class, middle class level. And that's where the problem in the theory actually lies. So I think we're actually in an era where if we want to get out of the problem, we have to start talking seriously about value added as a theory of production. And I know that, for example, in China, in spite of what I think you're going to hear this afternoon, we there are, are going people to talking about hear oh, that one now, lesson. after coffee. Well, all right. <laughs> that, that, that I actually think that, there w that apart from the high tech, the communications area, there is a real need for a relaunching of the marketplace through family-owned and, and, and small groups launching smaller corporations mm -hmm. to do interesting things. I think these big corporations are lazy, inefficient, bureaucratic bodies which use their financial clout to make the market less efficient. And I think this is a very interesting moment to bring capitalism back into the marketplace with smaller family-owned groups of friends coming in who understand risk, understand creativity, and I think we'll see something very interesting happened, particularly in terms yeah, of well, value-added. Although we have to go to the coffee break, I know, but I, this is simply, I cannot stand, uh, I leave that standing <laughs> in this room. So first of all, when you don't like the outcome, you say the data are wrong. That's nice. Um, I just said this is the data that we have. Uh, and uh, regarding taxation levels, we don't observe what you are saying. Uh, taxation levels, um, are not going down in the sense that the effective amount paid by investors, the effective amount paid by capital owners is not going down. That's the one thing. The second thing I would like to say is... I said labor standards. I wasn't very good. Yeah, well, you were, you, but um, we were talking about taxation. You said we can't, uh, we can't get an international taxation agreement because it is too complicated. It is very, very complicated, of course. But you were talking about taxation levels. And when you look at taxation, it's not true. Similarly regarding, similarly regarding labor standards, uh, when uh, you can collect different forms of data, can look at different <coughs> indices, uh, can look at different individual um, legal standards, it's not true that the level of labor standards went down in uh, the OECD countries because of globalization. That's simply not true. And finally, when you are saying um, we should go the way of small and medium-sized enterprises, that's fine to have them all. They are the most innovative ones, that's true. Um, the uh, large, big corporations have uh, stronger difficulties to innovate. They become, um, with uh, the managerial influences you are mentioning, large administrative bodies not so um, different from what we observe in the uh, state administration, the government administration. It's also a hi hierarchical uh, entity uh, which is uh, moving only slowly. But on the other side, uh, you should be careful with that argument. Look at Italy. You have many small-sized enterprises, and Ita Italy is not growing anymore because these small enterprises, they refuse of growing further because they don't want to be included in the highest labor standards that are existing there. Labor standards could be too high. That's the other side. 
You must keep in mind that not any labor standard is wonderful to have, and we only should to have should have a maximization of labor and environment. I, I they must be good. I don't. It must I don't be the optimal ones. That. And what you observe in Italy, in France, in Spain is the exact opposite. These labor standards are too high, and in that regard, in particular, globalization is putting a strong pressure on the governments to reduce that. Can, can I just one last line? <laughs> if, 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 if your data says that labor standards haven't fallen, then that is the ultimate argument in favor of the opening up of the economics department and the statistics departments to other ways of thinking and counting. Okay. So <laughs> now we are going to have uh, our conversation with Kofi. Uh, ich spreche jetzt Deutsch. Wir machen ein um, etwa 15 minütige Pause, dann werden wir die nächsten zwei Beiträge in diesem Blog finden und eine gemeinsame Conversation und dann liebes Publikum kommen Sie auch noch dazu, aber erstmal gibt es ähm, glaube ich genug zu diskutieren beim Kaffeepause. Etwa 15 Minuten. Herzlichen Dank an allen beiden und wir machen das später.